Hi, everybody. Um, don't be fooled by the recent hot IPO market. When we look at the data, 1980 to 1998, there were more than 5,600 IPOs in the United States. 1999 to 2018, under 3,000. The size of the public markets overall has been cut in half over the last two decades. So we're here today to take on a big question, which is, are the public markets broken, and is there a better model? Today we have with us one of the best sources available to tackle this question, Henry Ward, CEO and co-founder of the software platform and financial infrastructure uh, platform Carta. Carta manages half a trillion, a little more than half a trillion, up to 600 million now in equity for 11,000 or over 11,000 companies. So the first thing we want to do is set the stage. Um, Elon Musk channeling his best Warren Buffett had recently said during a conference call, being a publicly traded company is like having someone stand at the edge of your house and just randomly yell different prices every day. Yet it's the same house. So the question to start with is, are we valuing companies properly today for the management teams, for the employees, for the investors? It's arguably the single most important piece of data that we have in the capital markets. But before we get to that, I just want to ask you to walk everybody here through your business model. What does Carta do? Who are its customers? Um, and any revenue figures you can share with us? Yeah, sure. So um, our core, we have a, two businesses, our core software business and then a financial product and infrastructure business. The core software business is helping companies manage their equity. And so we, we're the primary custodian uh, for equity as well as the transfer agent to get an equity from point A to, uh, or shares from point A to point B. And then on top of that uh, infrastructure to manage this equity, we also uh, work on capital market infrastructure where how do we help companies get liquidity, how do we sell shares, how do we buy shares, how do we create a marketplace uh, and a stock market for private assets. Okay, and we had the CB Insights funding detectives do a little work for us before this. Um, your last round valued the company at 1.7 billion with a $55 million revenue run rate. Um, they had that at a 30.9 times forward multiple. Um, they compared that to Solium, a competitor recently acquired by Morgan Stanley, it's only at 8.3 times. Um, that's a massive gap in the words of the CB Insights data sluice. Um, so walk us through just why investors are, are justifying that, that rich forward multiple for your firm. You know, what is it that you're doing now and that you plan to do in the future that you think goes into that? Yeah, so 90% of the world's assets are, are privately owned. Uh, and a lot of companies, uh, and, and we live in a weird world where uh, there's somewhat of an arbitrary line between public and private, and companies that are public and shares that are publicly registered, there's hyper liquidity in these markets, so much so that people are buying machines closer to exchanges to get uh, more liquidity. And then in the private world, there's zero. Uh, and there's nothing in between, and it's an odd artifact of history from, from 1933. Uh, a lot of uh, companies have tried to tackle this. How do we build a stock market? How, how do we create liquidity in the private world uh, to compete against liquidity in the public world? Uh, nobody's cracked the code, uh, and the reason uh, investors got excited about what we're doing is they think we have a shot at being the company that cracks that code. Uh, and if, if we do, the, it's a new market that doesn't exist today, and sort of by definition, uh, new markets are markets where uh, money exchanges hands that didn't exchange hands, hands before, and there's a lot of money in the private world to exchange hands. And if we're the enabler of that, uh, that's a pretty um, exciting uh, prospect. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you believe the, the idea of a private versus a public company is fundamentally going to change in the future. I mean, I can think back years when I would get these lists of the largest private companies in the world, the Cargills of the world. I would look at it and say, oh, yeah, right, I always forget that these are private companies, but there are 12 of them. So, you know, it's, it's the outliers. You don't believe that's going to be the case in the future, do you? You see it staying private um, for a long time as not being an outlier position for firms, if you're successful. Yeah, uh, so uh, prior to the Jobs Act, one of the primary drivers to get, uh, for companies to go public was regulatory. So you couldn't have more than 500 uh, shareholders, and if you did, you need more um, uh, disclosure requirements. Uh, with the Jobs Act, that was removed. It allowed companies to stay private longer, which actually, interesting, was not the intent of the Jobs Act. It was an um, unexpected side uh, effect of that. And so companies are staying private longer uh, 
Um, primarily because there's a lot of advantages for a CEO to stay private. The, the two most important ones is private company CEOs, unlike our public company uh, cousins, we get to pick our investors. And so we can pick investors that have the same duration of timeline for us that are highly aligned with what we're doing. There, there's no such thing as short sellers in the public world. Um, there's no such thing as activist investors. And so we have a lot more freedom in aligning the stakeholders of the business to, to us. Uh, the, the, second, uh, uh, so the second piece of that or the corollary uh, of that is our stock is not a commodity. So if I'm recruiting an executive or an employee that, that believes very much in our vision, uh, they, they can't access stock unless they become an employee. I, there's no way for them to access this. And so I've decommoditized stock. I can now use it as a, a recruiting tool and a, a leverage uh, tool. The third um, reason why I have an advantage or private company CEOs have an advantage is we control our information disclosure. Uh, so when you go public, the SEC decides how much and how you disclose information in the private world, we get to decide. Uh, and that's a very powerful uh, tool for us. Um, that will change over time as private companies access more liquidity, where liquidity uh, follows uh, access, participant access, uh, and transparency. Uh, information. And so as info, if, if a company wants more liquidity as a private company, they will have to expose more uh, information uh, to more participants. But if they don't want liquidity and they want the advantage of privacy, they can constrict that information uh, uh, much, much further. And you mentioned that you get to the private company CEO, you get to pick your investors. Um, can you give us examples of when you're a private company CEO? Who do you pick? Who, who are the ideal investors beyond just venture capital firms, which we all know. And what do you see in the future in terms of if more companies are staying private and they get to pick their investors, what are those entities going to be? Yeah, so uh, typically when a CEO goes out and raises uh, private capital, they're, they're looking uh, for two things. Uh, one is, um, can the venture firm or the partners or whatever the private equity investment firm is, can they be helpful and accretive to the business? Can they help um, uh, change the trajectory of the business uh, with the expertise and the relationships they have beyond capital? Cap capital is commodity. Uh, the, hope, the hope is that the people that are managing that capital um, uh, are not com commodity. Um, and that's a, a, a big part of it. The, the, the second piece of it is, are they aligned both with the vision? So do they really uh, care about the vision and can see how the vision go, uh, looks? And they have capital that can, can match the duration that you need that capital. So you know, we have a sort of a multi-decade vision and a roadmap of what we want to do. And so when we get uh, capital, uh, we're looking for capital where at they're at least willing to deploy that and keep that for a decade. Uh, and so, and in fact, one of the um, one thing that is probably little known, um, but there's this um, new new set of cash that's becoming available to private companies, which is these are called evergreen funds, where they in fact have no duration. Uh, they keep capital recycling within to the fund, so they're willing to hold 30 years. Uh, if you need them to. Uh, and that's a very powerful um, piece of building out the capital structure, uh, especially as companies are getting more cash capital thirsty to get the capital that you need in the right duration, where in contrast to public companies, uh, capital is hot. Uh, it moves quickly, and it moves quickly on short-term uh, perspectives on the company. And how important will the role of the largest money managers in the world be, if you think it will be? If we look at BlackRock, six trillion, or maybe more after the Dow's recent six-day winning streak and assets under management, Larry Fink has talked a lot about getting away from quarterly guidance, getting away from that short-term game. Um, and you see his firm and others that manage the vast majority of mutual fund, ETF assets, and institutional pension funds as well, talking about trying to move beyond that short-term mentality. Do you just not think it's for real, it's ever going to happen, it's a good sound bite, but the fact of the matter is, as long as it's publicly traded stocks, we're just not, there's not gonna be a momentum to see that type of change that he's talking about? Uh, yeah, I think the, the micro market structure of public companies um, really creates this tension where Wall Street makes money on volatility. Uh, and so there's this tension between investment managers who, who don't want volatility and, and then the, the brokers and the investment banks that give them access to capital markets who do want volatility. And historically, it is, it is the owners of the, the access to capital markets that have won. And that's why markets are volatile. Uh, that, that's why you know, investment bankers uh, make more than I do, uh, where I'm a wealth creator. They're a wealth taker. 
Uh, and so uh, I, I think that will always really be a struggle in the public world. I think we have this unique um, uh, advantage or, or edge in the private world where the, the alpha in the public world is going to zero. It is very hard for these banks now to make money uh, in, the, in the public world. Uh, there's just so much competition. All vast majority of alpha uh, is, be created, is being created in the private. Uh, world and a lot of companies want to. A lot of these investment managers want to move in and be able to create alpha uh, in the private world that they can't get to in the public. And you mentioned an important point. Um, you mentioned this to me previously that you know when you look at the way the capital markets are structured today, the current infrastructure, it's really only working for the one percent. Um, sounds like a great presidential soundbite. You know, Howard Schultz has left, may have suspended his campaign. Maybe you can step in. But what is? What does that mean outside of a political context? What do you mean when you say it's only working for the 1%? And you don't mean it just about public companies. You mean it about private companies, too. Part of your whole vision is that the Americans who are locked out of the private markets will ultimately be able to invest in it. Yeah, you know, when you look at uh, Amazon, they went public at 400 million bucks. Uh, Facebook uh, at 100 billion. Uh, Uber. Uh, at 80 billion. And so, so the average American is locked out of that growth curve from a billion dollar company to a hundred billion dollar company. The, the, the average American can't get a hundred X return on their investment on a solid, a billion dollar company is a solid company. It's not a high risk uh, company. And so they're being locked out where accredited investors, which by definition are the richer people, uh, get access to that. Now the average American gets the second you know, leftovers of this company and are looking for 10% uh, returns uh, year over year. And that's just an expansion of uh, the, the richer getting richer with more access uh, and then people that don't have access really struggling uh, with that access. Do you think that's, at least in part, um, causing some of the tensions we see in the markets today? Obviously we have, we had a bunch of recent IPOs that were overvalued, if you want to believe that. We had a bunch that were underpriced and shot up like crazy. We have the direct listings from Spotify and Slack next. We have people on both sides. We had you know, the famous VC investor Bill Gurley saying yesterday, every time the press writes about an IPO surging, what they don't realize is it just means that the bankers did a really bad job pricing it in the first place. It didn't surge, it just wasn't priced correctly. Um, we see the same thing when a deal goes down. So what you're talking about there with these companies staying private for longer, is that contributing to this volatility in the IPO market? You know, it's, it's very hard to price a company, particularly in that trans, and I, I'm the last person to make excuses for bankers, but uh, it's very hard uh, to price that transition from a private to a public company. And, you know, a, a lot, there's a lot of criticism about, hey, private companies are overvalued. Um, something to understand about the difference between pricing and the private uh, public uh, world is first, a private uh, uh, um, investment uh, pricing is done on an auction model. Uh, there's one seller, uh, and it's the company or the CEO, and then there's multiple buyers, and the CEO effectively will take the, the best bid. Where in the public markets, it's a buy-sell. You have both sides of the market. So almost by definition, the private company uh, is going to get the best valuation that's available, where public companies, that's not true. The second uh, difference is private companies are valued by the first buyer. In the public company, it's valued by the last buyer. And so um, there's a sort of this sense of like the, the private investors don't know what they're doing. How could they possibly price all of these things? Uh, but the public markets really know how to price this stuff. Um, in part, uh, the pushback I'll, I'll give on that is in the private world, it is the first investor that has full disclosures. They understand the business better than anyone else. You know, um, Andreessen Horowitz led our, our last $300 million Series E round, and the investment memo for, that they put together was 80 pages long. Uh, when you look at the last buyer of a public market, often it's retail investors, it's uninformed investors. Uh, and so I, I would argue, is the last price set in the public markets more informed than the first price set in the private? And it's not a defense of private market valuations. We're certainly in a market that's on a long bull run. I think prices will change quickly when the market turns. Uh, but I, I, I think being to really understand why these dynamics happen, uh, it's important to understand the mar micro market structure of these two things. Uh, the last thing I'll say on that is something that also is not um, uh, captured in these conversations is investment in private companies and price setting is done on preferred stock, which have, have more rights and downside protection. 
on these. At IPO, these all convert to common, and there's no downside protection on common. And so there will be this natural changing in pricing of, of, uh, of these markets and, and, and figuring out when at IPO, when the first buyer on downside protection preferred stock now translates into the last buyer on common, th that is a hard thing to get right. Let's talk about a buyer or an owner of stock that a lot of people forget and is really important to you and your vision of the future, which is the employee of the company. A lot of people think, you know, in tech companies, obviously options are granted to employees, but that's a tech industry thing. That's not the way you see it, and you see it as being really important for companies and sectors outside of tech to get over that sort of cultural gap, if you want to call it that, of not thinking that way, that you think stock should be as common in companies as, as payroll, right, as traditional payroll. So can you explain that whole idea and, and why it's not happening today to the extent you think it should and what you plan to do about that? Yeah, sure. Our, our, you know, our mission is really to create more owners uh, in the world. Um, we have this view of, of, of human history uh, and, and how labor evolved. And the labor originally was indentured servitude. Uh, you know, it, it was a serfdom model where you had this job, you really had no other choice, you were paid the lowest amount, you were picking wheat and, and you gave it to the, to the uh, vassal. Uh, and then it, it evolved over time and now we're in the era of payroll. Uh, we think the next era of compensation and labor will, will involve ownership and it certainly has started in tech. Our hope is that it expands and that we can be an enabler of those things. So when we talk to the you know, largest private companies in the world with you know, 50,000, 100,000 employees, well, where only maybe the top 500 executives have, have uh, equity in the company, will say, hey, if you could um, put employees on uh, an equity platform and give them equity as cheaply and easily as you put them on payroll, uh, would you do it? And uh, uh, part of our mission is to expand that concept that started in, te in tech uh, to create more owners in, in the world where you can work for a firm for 30 years where today all you have is the gra grains of wheat you saved over that time uh, and instead you can walk away with a productive asset in this company. Well, let's get to the, the big idea, which a lot of people are gunning for Wall Street and the exchanges, you're one of them. Carta X, your idea for an exchange business, um, same time as your investor, Mark Andreessen, is backing the long-term stock exchange, which just got approval from the SEC. Um, you've made some hires from IEX, the trading firm exchange profiled in Michael Lewis's Flash Boys, what is it? You've mentioned to me that what you think you have that's special is you have this network of private assets, you have investors from LPs to um, you know, other investors, and access to all these private companies that allows you to put a solution out there that will basically disrupt, to use the word of you know, the world we're in today, the stock exchange business. Um, how long term is that, and why do you think it's going to work? Sure, I, I hope first trades will, will be happening next year. Uh, and I, it will take uh, you know, time to, to bootstrap liquidity. Uh, liquidity takes time to build, uh, but it grows, grows exponentially. Um, and uh, as you get more and more liquidity uh, locked in, you know, entering these markets, uh, you'll reduce bid-ask spreads, uh, you'll, you'll create a market-making uh, um, uh, business around this, uh, and liquidity will grow, grow very fast. And there's this very strong liquidity network effect that, that exists, you know, and there are all kinds of business, NYSE, NASDAQ have liquidity network effects, Airbnb, any marketplace has a liquidity network effect. And once you create this liquidity network effect, uh, it, it grows very, very quickly. And across the near 600 million that you have in the, the equity that you manage, it's I think 700,000 shareholders yep. that we're talking about. Yeah, and it's, it's growing. You know, we have about 25% of the um, uh, venture market. Uh, we add about 1% uh, uh, every month. Um, we're adding 20,000 shareholders a month uh, to the platform across investors and, uh, and employees. And as you get critical mass around participants in a marketplace, that further uh, pushes liquidity into that marketplace. One last question, then we'll get to the fun part. Um, you did also get into the public company um, business about a year ago or so. Um, why compete against the big transfer agents in that business? How does that fit into your overall vision? Yeah, um, so the transfer agency business is a terrible business. The brokerage business is a, a terrible business. Um, but we have a unique edge, uh, and we only go into markets when we, we have proprietary edge. And uh, the two, two edges that we have uh, are if you believe that this is an end of one market uh, uh, and there'll be one and only one platform to service these companies and their shareholders and hopefully that, that will be us. We're the pipeline to IPO. 
the IPOs of 2023 are Series B companies on, on Carta today. And that means we have first dibs at taking them public. And so we can um, uh, provide transfer agent services, equity services. We're already their private company transfer agent. There's no reason we shouldn't be their, uh, their public. Uh, and we can help these companies go public and displace bottoms up uh, uh, all the incumbents, you know, the computer shares, the, the E-Trades, the Charles Swabs. Um, the Wall Street made a mistake um, uh, in the last 30 years. Um, they, they thought they had a lock on capital markets, but they left the underbelly exposed. They didn't see it in the private world. And I, I think what's exciting about what, the opportunity in front of us is we have this opportunity to rebuild financial infrastructure from two founders in a garage uh, all the way to, to the largest private and public companies in the world. All right, rapid fire, overrated, underrated. We'll start with one of your competitors, Forge, formerly known as Equidate. Yeah, sure. Uh, we love the, we think those guys are philosophically aligned. Uh, I, I hate to say it because I'm friends with the CEO, but I think they're overrated. I think what they're missing in every other market, um, every other company that's tried to solve the second the liquidity problem is they don't own the underlying transfer agency. They're trying to build a marketplace. They're building a bulletin board. Uh, uh, and we've built the, the transaction platform. And so the, the way to think about this is they built Craigslist, we've built eBay. Craigslist got two people together and you had to figure out how to buy and sell this thing. Uh, eBay said, we're gonna guarantee the transaction. Uh, and that's a fundamental difference. All right, be careful about this one. Your investor, LTSE, Mark Andreessen. Uh, Just the stock exchange, not the person. Yeah, um, the, so the uh, LTSC, uh, uh, philosophically, super aligned on what they're doing. Uh, we know them super well. They're really solving, I think, an important problem in the public, public world. I, I think they certainly have a big challenge uh, ahead because they have very conflicting interests with the decision makers. For example, you know, the CEO is the person that decides uh, which exchange to go public on, but uh, their, their product, their exchange, is really designed to be shareholder value. And there is a, a very strong tension, particularly at the public company level, between CEOs and shareholders. And it's, it's one of the problems with that market structure. This one I think I can answer myself, but I'll let you have fun anyway. NYSE and NASDAQ, either one by one or together. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll throw them in the same, same pot. I, I thought you, know, you would. Yeah, you know, I, I think, uh, much like most of Wall Street, I think they're parasites. I, I think they, uh, you know, profit uh, being a middle, middle person um, and using uh, intermediation uh, to make money. You know, I think one of the, the things uh, that's shameful about the public world is that by the time um, a retail investor, you know, an average American um, uh, gets exposure to a productive stock asset, it's gone through this chain of, of, of people, you know, leeches sucking the alpha out of it. So by the time you get it, it, it all of the alpha's gone. Okay. Lastly, when will Carter's IPO be? Uh, <laughs> I, I have a mixed, um, mixed feelings about an IPO. Uh, I would say that if Carta becomes a, a much more liquid um, company, we'll, um, uh, we'll do it on our own uh, capital market infrastructure. Okay, Henry, thank you very much. Um, it was a good conversation for me. And yeah, thank you. Learned a lot. Thank you. Next up, we have uh, Bloomberg's Julie Burke.